My name is Gillian Osmond. I'm a paintings conserver at the Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art. In this presentation, I'm going to provide an update on current research on the subject of zinc soaps. In recent years, zinc soaps have been implicated in various forms of paint deterioration with increasing frequency. The number of paintings likely to be affected is significant due to the widespread use of zinc oxide in oil paint formulations from the late 19th century onwards, a key period for many Australian collections. However, while conservators are becoming increasingly adept at recognising soap-related deterioration, we are less confident in knowing how to manage the affected paintings or those likely to be susceptible. What is now widely accepted is that deterioration most typically occurs when zinc soaps are in crystalline form, which I will discuss in more detail shortly. Internationally, conservation scientists are working hard to determine the processes involved in metal soap formation. Understanding the chemistry is necessary before we can develop informed conservation strategies. Notably, a group of researchers from the Rijksmuseum and the University of Amsterdam are leading efforts to define a molecular model for soap formation. This presentation draws in large part from the findings of this group. And here I hope to explain some of the basic principles involved. First, it's helpful to be reminded of the triglyceride structures which form the basis of linseed oil. Constituent triglycerides are made up from a variety of fatty acids, most with chains of 18 carbons. The notional triglyceride molecule pictured here includes three different fatty acids, each with 18 carbons and one, two or three double bonds. The more double bonds, the greater the drying potential of the oil, as in the presence of air, the double bonds allow crosslinks to form, causing the oil to polymerize and dry. In addition to fatty acids with double bonds, linseed oil also includes saturated fatty acids with no double bonds, notably stearic acid, again with 18 carbons, and palmitic acid with 16 carbons. The absence of double bonds means that saturated fatty acids do not participate in crosslinking reactions. In this graphic, the carbon chains comprising the fatty acid triglycerides in the oral medium are represented by grey lines. As oxidative polymerisation of the oil progresses, carboxylate groups form. These negatively charged carboxylate groups then react with metal ions present in the paint from pigments or dryers. Zinc ions from zinc white or zinc oxide are particularly reactive in this way and the newly formed carboxylate groups progressively coordinate with zinc ions at the pigment surface. Zinc ions picked up from the pigment surface can then disperse through the oil polymer by effectively hopping from one carboxylate group to another. The more carboxylate groups that form during oxidation, the more zinc ions are extracted from the pigment and amorphous network coordinated zinc carboxylates develop in the paint, represented by the small coloured clusters in the graphic at right. As conditions allow, zinc carboxylates may form which are not connected to the cross-linked oil polymer. This can occur if there is an additional source of stearic acid, such as when aluminium stearate is present in the paint formulation, or through hydrolysis reactions, which sever bonds connecting the fatty acids to the polymer network. These free fatty acids preferentially react with the available zinc ions to form mobile zinc carboxylates. The transfer of zinc ions from the network to free fatty acids creates vacant carboxylate sites in the oil binder, and these in turn pull more zinc ions from the pigment. In effect, the zinc oxide progressively dissolves into the oil medium. As the concentration of zinc carboxylates increases in the paint, the mobile chains are drawn to one another and begin to crystallise as zinc soaps. It is in crystalline form that deterioration attributable to zinc soaps in paintings most typically occurs. Parts of the process I have just outlined have amazingly been captured with high magnification imaging techniques at the University of Queensland. This first image is of a zinc oxide particle taken at 600,000 times magnification using transmission electron microscopy. Rows of individual atoms are discernible, 
helping us conceive how zinc atoms can be progressively extracted from the pigment surface via reaction with carboxylate groups in the oil medium. Reducing the magnification a little, the image shown here captures a very early stage of zinc soap formation in a model zinc white oil paint. Linseed oil, zinc oxide and a small amount of water were mixed, applied to a glass slide and allowed to air dry at room temperature for seven weeks. A sample from the paint was microtomed in the microscope chamber to produce this reverse contrast scanning electron microscopy image. The darkest small particles are zinc white pigment, while the spherical grey features are zinc carboxylate clusters which have formed in the linseed oil, echoing the process represented in the adjacent diagram. Zooming in again, this incredible transmission electron microscope bright field image shows the start of zinc soap precipitation in the model paint. Because linseed oil is dominated by long 18 carbon chain fatty acids, soap crystallization typically resolves as closely packed parallel chains of the type illustrated. The gold inset image shows a three dimensional reconstruction of the soap precipitation with its characteristic layered plate like structure. The sequential process of oil polymerization, formation of network coordinated zinc carboxylates, and ultimately zinc soap crystallization is very clearly reflected in FTIR spectra of zinc white oil paint. The absorption band of interest for zinc carboxylate coordination is indicated by the blue window in the infrared spectra here. Zinc oxide itself does not absorb in the wave number range shown. However, oil paints containing zinc white quickly develop a broad carboxylate peak between 1500 and 1650 wave numbers, characteristic of network coordinated or amorphous zinc carboxylates. Crystalline zinc carboxylate soaps, on the other hand, absorb sharply at 1540 wave numbers, as seen in the bottom spectrum at the end of the sequence. A very clear change in FTIR absorption accompanies formation of crystalline zinc soap from stearic acid. In the experiment shown, zinc oxide and stearic acid powder were mixed into a vial of toluene. The stearic acid spectrum is shown here in red. Unlike in oil paint, in this model the stearic acid is not present in triglyceride structures and there is no cross-linked polymer network. There is therefore no initial formation of amorphous or network-bound zinc soaps. The stearic acid is soluble and mobile in the toluene and reacts quickly with the zinc oxide to form highly ordered crystalline zinc stearate, evidenced by the characteristic sharp bands seen in the lower spectrum. Zinc stearate absorptions completely replace the stearic acid bands which were initially present, indicating all detectable amounts of stearic acid in the sample have reacted with the pigment. The physical change which accompanies soap formation is also evidenced by the dramatic volume increase in the solid phase seen in the vial image at top left, which helps explain why protruding lumps are one way zinc soaps manifest in paintings. The rapid reaction between zinc oxide and stearic acid demonstrated here when stearic acid is able to move freely has implications for us in the treatment of paintings underlining the importance of avoiding exposure to conditions which might increase the availability and mobility of stearic acid within the oil paint network. So what are the conditions that might encourage soap crystallisation in paintings? There are factors both within and beyond our control. Paint composition is something we have to live with once a painting has been created, and the type of drying oil, paint additives such as aluminium stearate, and pigment grade in the paint will all influence soap formation. There is increasing evidence too that the early environmental exposure history of a painting affects initiation and formation of carboxylate groups and consequently zinc carboxylates as the paint cures and polymerizes. Elevated relative humidity is understood to be particularly significant in accelerating formation of carboxylate groups during auto-oxidation of the oil medium. Beyond the early life of a painting, 
Exposure to water or elevated relative humidity triggers release of fatty acids from the binding medium through hydrolysis reactions, shown in simplified form here. The free fatty acids released in this process are more mobile within the paint film than those which remain connected to the cross-linked oil. Saturated fatty acids, such as stearic and palmitic acid, are particularly susceptible to release as they lack the double bonds which allow participation in cross-linking reactions. Water is also thought to assist diffusion of both fatty acids and metal ions through the paint, including the process of iron hopping, whereby zinc ions migrate from the pigment particles into the polymerized oil network by transferring from one carboxylate group to another. The increased rate of metal ion migration enabled by water effectively accelerates pigment consumption by free fatty acids. Interestingly, the influence of relative humidity is thought to be greater for zinc soap formation than is the case for lead soaps. For conservators, the susceptibility of paintings to water exposure creates uncertainty for us in our use of water in treatments. While research continues to examine critical exposure thresholds, there is some initial reassurance in recent findings indicating short duration exposures are less likely to enhance rates of hydrolysis than prolonged exposure of the painting to elevated relative humidity levels. As always, however, ultimate risk will be influenced by the individual properties and condition of the paint film. The potential influence of solvent exposure on soap formation has also been considered in recent PhD research at the University of Amsterdam. Diffusion of solvent into a paint film is dependent on many factors, not least the condition of the paint, but has significant potential to redistribute free fatty acids which are present. As previously shown, the solubility of stearic acid in toluene enabled, rap enabled rapid reaction with zinc oxide to form soaps. In a painting, solvent and fatty acids in solution are obviously more constrained in their movement. However, solvent diffusion has been shown to enhance fatty acid transport through the binding medium. While essentially insoluble in water, stearic and palmitic acids are considered soluble in the range of solvents likely to be encountered in conservation treatments. Solvent choice and the amount and duration of exposure have been shown to influence diffusion. Together with paint condition and the degree of oil polymerization, these factors will determine the extent to which fatty acids are mobilized by solvent exposure. In the Amsterdam research, a model zinc white oil paint was exposed to ethanol as if being cleaned. Solvent diffusion mobilized free fatty acids contained in a separate layer below the zinc white paint and transported them into the upper layer where zinc soaps formed. While short duration ethanol exposures did not obviously alter the existing amorphous network bound zinc carboxylates, exposures of 30 minutes triggered significant soap crystallization in the paint. It is not uncommon to see how paint layers adjacent to a zinc white containing layer can influence soap formation in the zinc containing paint. One example is this triptych by Brisbane artist Davida Allen. Extensive cracking of the copper thalassionine pigmented blue paint has developed, together with serious delamination within the artist applied chalk and zinc based priming. This cross-section, taken from an affected area of the painting, shows the delamination occurring in the upper part of the ground. The backscatter electron image detail at lower right reveals that the affected zone has lower atomic contrast and fewer defined pigment particles than the rest of the ground layer, consistent with localised loss of zinc, of zinc oxide pigment at the expense of zinc soap formation. This interpretation is supported by FTIR analysis. The central two spectra are taken from superficial scrapings of the ground from the detached lifting paint and from the ground remaining on the canvas. 
They both have sharp carboxylate peaks indicating the presence of crystalline zinc soaps at the point of failure. This contrasts with the bottom spectrum recorded from an area of unpainted ground, where broad absorption indicates network coordinated zinc carboxylates. The different stage of zinc carboxylate formation in painted versus unpainted ground passages within the same painting suggests the binding medium of the blue paint has provided an additional source of fatty acids which have penetrated the ground and facilitated soap crystallisation there. So to conclude, current modelling on zinc soap formation in oil-based paintings shows the development of carboxylate groups during the early stages of paint cure and during subsequent ageing is a critical stage in the process. The presence of water accelerates both the formation of carboxylate groups and the migration of acid and metal ions through the paint. Network coordinated zinc carboxylates are not in themselves problematic in paintings. However, hydrolysis reactions or supply of free fatty acids from additives or other layers within a painting will encourage zinc soaps to crystallise. Prolonged exposure to elevated relative humidity is best avoided. And while the potential impacts of specific treatments on susceptible paintings remains an active area of research, risks can likely be reduced by minimising the amount and duration of water and solvent applied during treatments. To finish, I'd like to thank Jun and Katrine from the Rijksmuseum and University of Amsterdam who continue to build on research in this field and generously share their findings. They also agreed to my adopting some of their graphics for this presentation. I thank my colleagues at Quagoma for their continuing support and acknowledge the staff and facilities at the UQ Centre for Microscopy and Microanalysis and the Australian Synchrotron Infrared B9. Thank you. Hello, my name is Eden Christian and I am a painting conservator currently working at International Conservation Services in Sydney. I started working at ICS in 2018 after studying cultural materials conservation at the University of Melbourne. Today I will be discussing the ongoing investigation of an unknown substance on a modern synthetic polymer artwork within the public collection of the White Rabbit Gallery, Sydney, Australia. The White Rabbit Gallery is an Australian public art collection dedicated to works made in the 21st century, focusing on Chinese art. Opening in 2009, the gallery now includes more than 2,000 works by almost 700 artists. The paintings team first encountered the painting Black Screen by Chen Yufan in 2019 through our ongoing work with the White Rabbit Gallery when the paintings department carried out some routine condition assessments and subsequent treatments on the collection. Upon initial inspection in the White Rabbit Gallery storage facility, the four panels were in a fair condition. During this assessment, it became evident that the paintings were covered with a whitish hue on the paint surface. This whitish hue was thought to possibly be a surfactant or similar substance exuding from the paint. The primary issue we had while treating the panels the first time was that the whitish hue had mixed with the dust and dirt present on the surface. This mix of dirt and possible surfactant was obscuring the artwork and significantly changed the aesthetics. Here you can see some detailed photos of the difference between the affected areas on the front and the areas where the whitish hue was not seen on the edges and where some of the white hue had been initially rubbed off. Upon commencement of treatment, it was relatively easy to remove both the surface dirt and white hue through dry cleaning and further aqueous cleaning with pH adjusted waters. After treatment, it was discussed with the gallery that the whitish hue would most likely reappear sometime in the future as it was unclear what exactly was happening with the paint structure and possible material migration. Further research was not initially proposed as treatment was successful in returning the panels back to an excellent overall condition restoring saturation, colour and original sheen of the black paint and improving the contrast between the black and white areas. Periodic monitoring of surface changes, particularly the reappearance of the hue 
and annual cleaning was recommended. However, less than a year later, the White Rabbit Gallery contacted us again about the re-emergence of the white material. When we inspected the painting for the second time, it was noticed that the white hue had formed in a rather irregular pattern. This time, the white hue was much more concentrated to one of the four panels. Here, you can see that on the first panel, the upper corner is mildly affected, while the hue is concentrated mostly in the middle and edges of the painting. You can also see some of our cleaning tests on the photo. This unusual pattern led us to believe that something more was going on with the paint layers and structure, and that whatever was happening was happening quite quickly. Therefore, a different approach and more research needed to be undertaken. The artist Chen Yu Fan creates minimalist paintings that evoke his interest in Daoist philosophy. He particularly looks at mutual polarities of yin and yang, light and dark, meaning and meaninglessness, which are represented here in black screen. Two of four panels consist of holes punctured and burnt through the canvas at precise intervals representing text, while the middle two panels in the centre are textured with vertical markings. For the artist, the meaning is not in the image or the symbolism, but in the process of making itself, allowing him to empty his mind. Chen Yufan, in an interview with the gallery, described the making process of the black screen painting. He painted with diluted acrylic pigments on the canvas and waited for the paint to dry before painting another layer. He then repeated this process around 100 times until the surface reached a certain thickness and moisture that he was happy with. Then he used a modified electric soldering iron to make the texture and holes. So first, I wanted to better confirm what the white hue on the surface of the painting was. Thanks to Anne Carter and QA Goma, I was able to take some samples from the most affected panel and send them up for FTIR analysis. The analysis and interpretation of the results suggests the painting contains non-organic surfactant and acrylic dispersion paint, suggesting the material migrating to the surface is in fact a surfactant. The exact process behind the migration of surfactants is relatively unknown. However, the concentration of surfactant in the makeup of the paint, thickness of the layers and primer type of the painting, and ongoing environmental conditions all play a part. With hundreds of layers of paint differing in thickness, this art artwork could be said to be quite susceptible. Acrylic paints have been widely used by artists since the 1900s due to their many desirable properties, such as drying times, solubility parameters, and applicability to different substrates. Although acrylic paints have been on the market and used since the 1900s, what is common about the reactions occurring in the paintings is less known than the traditional oil paints, especially within conservation. Most preventative measures in conservation focus on maintaining the environmental conditions for the paintings. However, the usual standard and strict 20 degrees and 50% relative humidity cannot always apply due to the glass transition temperature of acrylic paints. Acrylic paints are understood to have a glass transition temperature close to room temperature. At lower temperatures, the paint could crack, while at higher temperatures, the paint could become sticky, leading to the danger of the surface dirt becoming entrenched into the paint itself. The White Rabbit Gallery have environmentally controlled storage that is set to the industry standard. The temperature is kept to 20 degrees and 50% relative humidity. You can see here a snapshot over three months with minor spikes when the doors to the storage are opened and work is done. The paintings are hung individually on sliding screens throughout the painting storage area, therefore could be affected differently depending on their proximity to the air conditioning units. Reducing the fluctuation of temperature and relative humidity as much as possible reduces the possible migration of the surfactant to the surface. However, the irregular pattern on one of the panels suggests that its proximity to the environmental controls from the roof could be affecting this section more. The irregular pattern could also be due to the paint application method. This area could have a different thickness of paint and or primer 
meaning that the panels have a different percentage of surfactant content and are reacting differently. The identification of the Y2 is still ongoing and presents a very interesting topic going forward. Another interesting conversation that has arisen around the issue is the ethics of removing the surfactant. The initial treatment aimed to improve the aesthetics of the painting so that it could be displayed in the gallery. In this instance, we know from the gallery's interviews with the artist that the Y2 is not intentional and therefore aesthetically incorrect. Nevertheless, there are many conversations discussing the importance of these materials due to the fact that they are original to the painting. However, practically, this instance, in this instance, this cannot be applied. One problem is that we have already seen upon the first inspection, both the white hue and surface dirt mixing together. If the glass transition temperature changes for any reason or other environmental changes occur, the dust could become too ingrained into the artwork to be removed. The other factor is that the gallery cannot display the artwork until the condition is adequate enough that it is ready for display. The research and treatment have also led to questions as to whether painting storage should become more specialised in the future. It is my understanding that most institutions have all paintings in the same storage facility, potentially only separating them based on subjective groups, accession numbers, or simply where they best fit into the storage. However, perhaps with continued research into acrylic paints and the impact of surfactants migrating to the surface, paintings may start to be grouped by materials allowing for different environmental conditions for traditional oil paintings versus those for acrylic paintings versus perhaps mixed media paintings. Due to the lockdown in Sydney, unfortunately we have not been able to return to the gallery to do any further tests and or treatments. We hope to get there by the end of this year. The gallery would prefer to continue to have the paintings cleaned for display purposes. Of course, there is a potential endpoint as we continue to clean the paintings the surface might reach a point where there is no surfactant left, reaching almost an equilibrium, especially as the reaction seems to be happening at a quick pace. We are in discussions with the gallery about preventive measures and ways to possibly slow down the migration while we continue research. Separate crates and separating the paintings into different environmental areas are both suggestions. This painting has been and continues to be a fascinating topic involving surfactant, migration, ethics of conservation versus the intention of both the artist and the gallery, and whether strict industry environmental controls are changing in response to modern materials. Lastly, I would like to thank the White Rabbit Gallery for allowing me to continue to conduct research on the painting from the collection. Anne Carter and QA Goma for undertaking the FTIR tests and discussing the results with me, and the paintings team at ICS for all their help and encouragement. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to this presentation on contemporary, commercially primed artist canvases. My name is Anne Carter and I work as a paintings conservator at the Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art in Brisbane. I'm speaking today from Mianjin, the unceded lands of the Turbul and Jagera people, and I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which I live and work, and to elders past, present and emerging. Today I'll be introducing a collaborative project between the Queensland Art Gallery and the Heritage Conservation Centre in Singapore. This research explores the materials of commercially primed canvases available to artists. The first part of this research was presented as preliminary results at IRUG in 2018 in Sydney, and later at the Conserving Canvas Symposium at Yale University in 2019, with postprints currently in press. We at Quagaimo were very lucky to work with Lynn and Filza and colleagues from the Heritage Conservation Centre in Singapore. Ruby was also able to join us as a consultant, often remotely from Melbourne and later from the US. Our research involved exploring canvas supports available to artists, and these canvas samples were collected in 2018 and 19. We also wanted to explore the implications for conservation of these canvases. 
We found that commercially primed artist canvases, although they're very common supports for contemporary painters, there is very limited product information for both artists and conservators to inform purchase choice or likely aging characteristics. Historical studies of commercially primed canvases document the frequent use of lead white, chalk, protein and oil and most of our training as painting as conservators and our subsequent risk management is informed by research involving these more traditional artist canvas materials. Today, however, canvas and priming materials are commonly substituted with synthetic alternatives. For example, Broman Ormsby and colleagues in 2008 studied 52 paintings from the Tate collection dated between 1963 and 2008 and they identified 60% of the grounds as acrylic emulsion, 27% as oil-based, 10% alkyd, and 3% other. We were thus interested to see if currently available canvases continue to reflect this breakdown. We were also interested to investigate the prevalence of synthetic fibre composition for artist canvases. This research was also prompted by observations over a number of years that some contemporary paintings exhibit unusual responses to conservation treatment, which is potentially attributable to their canvas support. You all know what I mean. Some paintings are so stretchy that you can key them out forever. Others have creases that are not able to be set flat using humidity and weight. Some priming seems to tolerate high temperature without change and others show unusual priming discoloration or even delamination of subsequently applied oil paint. Today's presentation will cover the results of the research into artist canvas samples and apologies to those who have already heard some of this information. And will also present case studies of some paintings from the Quag Goma collection. Firstly, though, I'd like to introduce Ruby Auburn, who in the early stages of this project got us organized with samples of artist canvases and who will outline our process for developing a sample set for this study. Thanks for that introduction. As Anne mentioned, my name is Ruby and I am happy to be here with you all sharing this research. Um, so to initiate the project, 37 Australian and Singaporean painters were digitally surveyed regarding their choice of canvas support. Um, the survey results provided insight into the artist's requirements for their canvas, um, how they chose their supports, and the brands that they use. Uh, this in turn assisted in the selection of canvas samples for analysis. In regards to selection, the surveyed artists were more likely to choose their canvases by trial and error, availability, working qualities, and price point. Further, um, most of the painters purchased commercially primed canvases all of the time. However, when asked to list the priming materials, the most common answers were um, acrylic, primer, or gesso. When selecting a canvas, many of the surveyed artists were unaware of the priming type and did not vary the canvas according to whether they were using oil or water-based paints. Such commercially primed canvases are usually made available as universal with a synthetic emulsion priming suitable for both water and oil-based paint or um, with oil priming suitable for oil paint. Commercial developments of priming materials over the past 70 years include transitions from polyvinyl acetate to PVAC acrylic copolymers to acrylics and styrenated acrylics. With ingredients not listed when purchasing pre-primed canvases and minimal information available to um, artists regarding these materials, the survey findings suggested a need to document commercially primed canvases today. 53 commercially primed artist canvases were collected in 2018 and 2019 from art stores in Australia and Singapore, uh, representing 19 brands uh, manufactured in Europe, China, Australia, the USA, India, and Mexico. 
um, the brand names are listed on this slide. Each sample's verso and cross section were photographed in visible light and UV, weave patterns were identified and thread counts taken. Um, for all samples, canvas fiber, priming binder and pigments plus fillers were analyzed using optical microscopy, FTIR, PI GCMS and XRF. Um, some samples were further analyzed with Raman spectroscopy and SEM EDX um, analysis. In addition, uniaxial tensile strength testing and heat testing was undertaken. And now on to results of canvas sample analysis. Fibre analysis showed good correlation with the information provided by manufacturers, with cotton the most prevalent fibre at almost 60% of samples, followed by linen, polyethylene terephthalate and PET cotton blends. Three weave patterns were identified in the canvas fabrics. Most were plain weave, being a one by one thread, followed by half basket, one by two threads, and a few as full basket, two by two threads. Cotton was typically found as a half basket, while linen, PET and PET cotton blends were mostly plain weave. These weave patterns reflect manufacturer design to strengthen weaker fibres by either doubling the thread, such as in a full basket, or by doubling only the warp or the weft, as, as seen in a half basket. 25% of cotton samples had a thread count of 10 by 30 threads per centimetre. Otherwise, thread counts varied. And here are some examples of different weave types under both visible light and ultraviolet illumination. Hopefully you can see clearly the different weave patterns. And you can also see in two of these samples the presence of optical brighteners under ultraviolet illumination. The sample on the left, Quag 46, you can see that the optical brightener is visible from the reverse in the priming layer. The sample in the center, Singapore 21, optical brightener is seen only in one orientation of the fibre. In the linen sample, Quag 24, there was no fluorescence under ultraviolet illumination, so it's not imaged here. ATR FTIR analysis of the top priming layer <clears throat> allowed characterization of oil, acrylic, polyvinyl acetate, and polyvinyl acetate acrylic copolymers both with and without styrene. Further detail of binder constituent was provided with the PYGCMS analysis. In this sample set, we were interested to find that styrenated acrylic binders predominate. And styrene was detected in 62% of all primings, which did provide some concern given its propensity to yellow on exposure to UV radiation. The high incidence of styrene was a surprise, as in the past it's been associated with cheaper materials and poor stability. Although advice from the paint industry was that styrene may be preferred in formulations because of its properties and not always chosen due to its affordability. There were relatively few oil primed canvases in this sample set, only four. However, interestingly, synthetic binders were identified in the lower priming layers of two of these oil primed canvas samples. Titanium dioxide and chalk predominated in the synthetic primings as pigments and fillers, typically in combination but sometimes singly. Other pigment combinations including barium sulfate with titanium white and or zinc white were found in 9% of samples, primarily in oil priming but not always. The canvas samples were usually identified as U for universal priming or O for oil priming. And in the universal priming, 34 different synthetic copolymer combinations were found in the 53 samples analysed. And within the 60% of paintings with acrylic based priming layers, PYGCMS identified seven different acrylic monomers used. The most commonly represented acrylic copolymers were styrene butyl acrylate, 
followed by butyl acrylate, methyl methacrylate. Although characterization of the percentage combinations of monomers was beyond the scope of this study, it's useful to note that different monomers are combined to achieve desired acrylic product characteristics, such as softness and hardness. You can see here that combining a higher percentage styrene to butyl acrylate, for example, results in a polymer with a higher TG, thus a harder polymer. We were surprised to find so many different formulations of copolymers, even within brands, and this indicates that there is a wide variety in the manufacturer in the coatings industry. Priming layers were also investigated by preparation of cross sections. Only 32% of samples contained a single priming layer, often with a regular thickness, and you can see some single priming layers here in figures A and C. Others appeared as double layers. Double priming layers included combinations of acrylic over styrenated acrylic, such as figure B, acrylic over acrylic PVAC copolymer, figure D, and oil over styrenated acrylic, which is not shown in this slide. All four of the oil prime canvases were on linen canvas, and of the four oil primed canvases analysed, Zinc carboxylates, either amorphous or crystalline, were evident at the top layer of three samples. In this slide, you can see that amorphous zinc carboxylates, indicated by a broadband centred at wave number 1571, suggest in situ formation, which in sample A appear to have migrated from the lower priming layer, which is the only layer to contain zinc oxide. In sample B, however, which contains no zinc oxide, zinc stearate was likely a constituent in the priming formulation. In three out of the four cases, the oil primed canvases were found to also contain synthetic polymer based underlayers. And thus the benefits for artists choosing oil prime canvases appear to be unclear. So using understanding gained from the analysis of canvas samples, Commercial priming from 17 paintings from the HCC and Quagoma collections were analysed. Paintings were selected based on date, uh, the use of pre-primed canvas, and observation of unusual ageing or treatment characteristics possibly related to the pre-primed canvas materials, such as those listed on the slide. The aim of the case studies was to see if there were any patterns or correlations that could be found relating to commercially primed canvas type and four Quagoma paintings are discussed. I'd like to note that these case studies are observational in nature and are presented to open up discussion. It's acknowledged that not all variables have been fully explored to explain these observations and that the observations relate specifically to the artworks discussed and are not necessarily applicable to other paintings by the same artist. The first painting I'd like to discuss is an oil canvas by Chinese artist Zhen Gogu, who was born in 1970. This artist's work is conceptualised around his immersive study of Chinese spirituality. Zheng's work has been shown in multiple international exhibitions, and this work was acquired by Craig Goma after the Asia Pacific Triennial in 2018. This painting has recently been restretched following its acquisition on a hardwood strainer. Its tension has always been very loose with saggy distortions and it is very responsive to small changes in environmental conditions. The priming was analysed and found to be acrylic over a PVAC layer. Interestingly, the canvas fibre was analysed as a PET cotton blend in a half basket weave and it is thought that the uneven nature of the half basket weave of the canvas may be contributing to the sensitivity of this painting to changes in environmental conditions. Maria Taniguchi, born 1981, is a Philippine artist who is best known for her ongoing series of large brick paintings, which are installed sitting directly on the gallery floor, leaning against the wall. Taniguchi has shown internationally and Quagoma acquired this painting following exhibition in APT8 in 2015. 
Due to its large size, this painting was transported rolled and was stretched on arrival at Quagoma. The canvas support presented puckering of the unstretched canvas when unrolled. It was also very stretchy and showed tolerance to heat above 45 degrees Celsius. Analysis indicates that this artwork is painted on an acrylic primed cotton canvas, which is in a half basket weave. The acrylic priming is pigmented primarily with chalk. Similar to the Zheng discussed earlier, it is thought that the stretchiness and the tendency to distortion when unstretched may be related to the half basket weave of this canvas. This priming layer was also tested for heat tolerance. We found no visible effect of the priming up to 80 degrees Celsius. It is proposed that the heat tolerance of the priming may be related to its high chalk content and possibly a lower binder content. Simon Gende is a Papua New Guinea artist who exhibited in the Asia Pacific Triennial. Um, Quagoma has a number of paintings by Simon Gende in its collection. However, this painting, Bride Price Arrangements, remains in the artist's collection. On arrival for exhibition in 2018, this painting required stretching. The binder uh, of this painting was not able to be determined using FTIR ATR, possibly because of its low content. And the priming was found to be pigmented predominantly with chalk. The canvas is on a plain weave cotton. During stretching at Quagoma, heat tolerance was tested and again, no visible effect on the priming was noted up to at 80 degrees Celsius. During undertaking treatment to flatten creases, it was also noted that this canvas had a very fast response to humidity treatment with visible changes in the plane of the canvas occurring after a short humidification time. Perhaps the predominance of chalk in the priming is a factor in this painting's responses to heat and humidity. Also on unstretching the work three months later after the exhibition, it was also noted that the acids from the uncoated parts of the Western Red Cedar stretcher at the mitre had discolored the cotton canvas. The reasons for this are not clear. This last case study is of a painting by William Robinson, who is a significant and very much well-loved Australian artist whose work has been collected by private, regional and state collections throughout Australia and internationally. Research by Sophie Theobald Clark and Gillian Osman in 2016 found that dark tide Bogenbar, dated 1994, presents isolated areas of pinpoint losses at the paint ground interface, leaving the ground intact. These losses often have idiosyncratically rounded edges and have typically occurred without obvious cracking or flaking prior to loss. Robinson generally prefers to use commercially prepared canvas supports with an oil-based lead white priming. Analysis of the commercial priming of this painting found zinc stearate at the top ground layer of dark tide bogenbar. FTIR ATR of the commercial priming of Robinson's Dark Tide Bergenbar found correlation with analysis of canvas sample Quag 37, which is a Classen's brand oil primed linen. Quag 37 was found to have a zinc oxide layer underneath the top layer of titanium white and barium sulfate. This correlation is a reminder that zinc carboxylates and stearates may already be present at the surface of commercially applied oil grounds when purchased and have the potential to affect subsequent oil paint adhesion. So in summary, we've learned much during this research project. Significantly, there appears to be no standard formulation for the commercial priming of artist canvases, not even within brands. So it's impossible to know exactly what you are buying. Although not thoroughly investigated, there appears no obvious trend in formulations linked to price point. Styrenated acrylics were the most common priming used in this sample group, with no alkyd priming found. This may reflect a formulation shift since Ormsby's research in 2008. Chalk and titanium white are major pigments found, and zinc carboxylates were found at the surface of three of the four oil-primed canvases. 
Cotton canvases and half basket weave predominated and synthetic canvases were not common. Correlations between canvas and priming, priming formulation and treatment observations were not clear, although some patterns did emerge. Acrylic PVAC copolymer binders were most frequent in the artwork priming layers, with styrenated acrylics less common than in canvas samples. As the canvas samples post-date the artwork samples, this indicates a possible increase in the use of styrene in commercial priming formulations, with uncertain long-term implications. One of the main recommendations from this research is for painters to avoid leaving commercial priming layers exposed as a white colour in their paintings. This is because styrenated copolymers left exposed as part of the painting image may be vulnerable to yellowing from UV radiation over time. Thus, it is recommended that priming should be covered with paint. Other observations were that higher heat tolerance was ob observed in artwork priming with a high chalk content. Stretchiness and puckering during treatment were associated with half basket weave cotton canvases. And crystalline and amorphous zinc carboxylates at the surface of artwork oil priming may be associated with delamination of subsequently applied oil paint. So I'd like to just let you know that more details about the analysis of the canvas samples is forthcoming in the Yale University publication which is currently in print. And also that as we couldn't fit all of our data in the Yale University publication, we've also published a data table on the Quag Goma website with all of our analysis details and images. And here, if you're looking for a particular brand or a particular canvas, uh, you, can, you can search it up against its analysis results. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. I would also like to note that the analysis of these Campbell canvas samples are particular to the, to the samples in this study, even when we tried to uh, verify our results by purchasing the same canvas from the same supplier, the same brand and the same code. We did sometimes um, receive canvases which had different analysis results to the first sample analyzed. So please take that in mind. So again, I'd like to thank you for your attention and also to acknowledge our colleagues at the Heritage Conservation Centre in Singapore. And I'd like, like to thank the Quag, Quag Goma Foundation for their project support. Thank you.